Big news in the world of Sketch today, Sketch 3.7 has come out, and it's one of the most significant updates that we've received in a long time. And I want to talk about my top three favorite features, what I see as the most significant uh, enhancements to Sketch 3. There are a bunch of things, a bunch of things, and a lot of them are under the hood, performance-related things, but there are three that I see as being uh, really worth talking about. And the first one, the biggest one, is the way symbols work. So I'll start from the most significant and work my way down. And uh, the way symbols work has been completely revamped. They're much higher performance, they're easier to manage, and uh, I'm going to show you how that works right now. So here I've got a group, and just as before, we are turning groups into symbols, and symbols, for those of you who are not familiar with it, are design elements that we reuse. And in using a symbol versus creating a bunch of manual instances of that element, we're able to update one and it changes everywhere. The problem with that came when we had repeating types of elements, like here I have a list of names with pictures next to them. It's not really completed, but that's all part of the demo here. And uh, the pictures are different and the text is different, but the style really overall should be the same. So we can use a symbol to make sure that they all match perfectly, but then we have to change some of the variables here. We have to change the pictures to be different for each one, we have to change the text to be different for each one. Uh, and with that, we might have a little problem here. There's a check mark next to this name, and if we save this as a symbol, it looks like we might have a problem when the name is shorter or longer, but they actually thought of that. <laughs> this, they did a really good job. They did a really, really good job here. So let's take a look at what happens when I turn this into a symbol. Now when I take this group here, this person entry group, and I create a symbol, it gives me this new panel, lets me give it a name, and it also says, send symbol to symbols page. There is a new way of managing your symbols here, and that is to put all of your symbols on a page. Each one gets its own artboard, and to manage them from there, meaning to make changes there, and uh, to delete them from there if you want to get rid of a symbol. And if you've already used a symbol, uh, it will turn any instance of that symbol back into a regular group if you delete it from the symbols page. But let's take a look at what happens here. I'll click OK. And then here we have the symbols page. And if I click over to the symbols page, you can see that I have this, <coughs> um, pardon me, this person entry uh, symbol, which gets its own artboard, which at a glance, it might look like that's not really a, a big deal. But if any of you guys had the problem before where you moved things around in a symbol, and then things went completely haywire with the positioning of those instances. That's because the symbol was kind of on an invisible artboard, but you couldn't see it. So if you move something to the left like this, you didn't realize that you were moving it out of the original uh, scope of the position of that symbol. So now that you can actually see the artboard, uh, you won't run into that problem anymore. You'll know when you're moving something out of, out of bounds, so to speak. So that's a really big deal. So let's take a look here at what happens with instances of the symbol. So I'm going to go to page one, and I've got one instance of this symbol so far. And I'm actually going to go and I'm going to get rid of everything that I have here, because I want to show you guys real quick how to place a symbol. I don't want to get rid of that white box, though. By the way, I'm holding the Option key as I lasso these things, so that way I'm only selecting what's contained completely within my rectangular marquee or my lasso that I'm dragging, rather than getting rid of this white box, this here, this here, this here. Uh, I'm only getting rid of the things that were contained completely within it. And again, that's to hold Option as you click and drag. It's a really, really cool shortcut. Uh, you can see here that as I drag, none of these things are becoming selected because I'm holding Option, but as soon as something falls completely within my selection, it becomes selected. So that's pretty cool. Now let's take a look at another subtle difference when you go to insert a symbol, and that's that when you select a symbol to insert, it actually gets attached to your cursor here, which is pretty cool. You get to place it where you want it, rather than it getting dropped into an arbitrary position and then having to go and reposition it. So the next thing, if you guys glance over to the left, uh, as I mentioned earlier, each one of these is going to have to have a different picture and different text. And what they've done here is they've made it so that any images and any text contained within a symbol becomes an overridable uh, sort of variable. So now I can change these things on a symbol by symbol basis and all the rest of the properties of the symbol, uh, the contents of it in terms of graphics, the style of everything, the position of everything, that all gets retained. Uh, all I have to worry about is changing the content, and the content goes where it belongs. So before I make those changes, let me duplicate this real quick. I'm going to hold Option and drag. I'll go down, uh, I guess I can go down an arbitrary number of pixels. I'll do 42. And I'm going to hit Command D to duplicate what I've done here a few times, just to, just to get the, the screen filled up here. 
So now that I've done that, I can select the second instance of this symbol here. And here where it shows image, I've got some images set aside. I can drag in a different image, or I can use the choose image uh, dialog box to go about that. And I can do that for each one of these. I can go in and quickly fill in all of these pictures. So let me do the last two real quick since we're almost there. And the last one, I believe, was this guy here, Todd. Cool. All right, I don't have all the names memorized, but this is just a demonstration. So uh, one thing I want to point out, see how it says name and then Michael Shelton. The fact that it says name here is not magic, by the way. If we go back to the symbols page and we take a look here at the layer that has the name in it, it is called name. So that's important to note. Uh, it is actually called name. So the name of the layer becomes the name of the label here on the override. So uh, one more reason to be diligent as you name your layers. So I can name her Sue, and I can name this guy, or might be a gal there, name her Anna. And one thing that you'll maybe notice, maybe maybe uh, you skipped right over it because it's very subtle. Uh, this check mark here is just a layer to the right of this text box, uh, but you'll notice that it moved here. And when you're using text overrides, this is another one of the enhancements that they've made. When you're overriding the value of text, as it gets longer or shorter, if there's a layer next to it, and that layer uh, is in a position to be bumped up against by this text box, depending on the length of it, it will move that automatically. It's really cool. That's one of those big new enhancements that they made. And even if the name gets longer, so I'll do uh, Michael Shelton the third. Let's just do I, I, I. And watch here, when I hit return, because of the I, 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 it has to push it to the right, and it does and it does a really phenomenal job. Uh, so far, I've had a pretty good experience with that. It hasn't made any weird mistakes. So now that we've got all these dropped in here and we've got an idea of how the overrides work, uh, let's look at a couple other little details. And that has to do with what happens when you create a symbol um, and you don't choose to put it on the symbols page. Because if you remember correctly, there was an option to add it to the symbols page and I chose to go with that. Now, if I select something like this little guy here, and I choose Create Symbol, and I don't send it to the Symbols page, uh, what happens? Because, like I said, when you delete something from the Symbols page, it gets rid of it. So what actually happens, if you look at the Layers list here, is it creates that symbol on the existing page. And if I hit Command-2, it'll bring me over to it. And if I zoom out, um, it is on this page. It just kind of slapped it on this page. So the symbols page is not a whole nother way of working. It's just a way of conveniently setting aside the symbols so you don't make a mess on your existing page or whatever page it is that you're working on. Um, if you want to, though, you can do that. You can keep them all on the same page if you don't want to have multiple pages in your document. That's absolutely fine. The other thing is if I go over to the symbols page here and uh, I'm creating these symbols for the sake of export, uh, having all of your symbols on one page allows you to mark those symbols for export so that you're not going through and keeping track of which instance of which symbol is the one you marked for export in your design where you've used that symbol a hundred times. If you use a symbol a hundred times and you only mark one of them for export, um, I don't know about you, I'm not going to remember which one is the one that I marked for export. So uh, doing that on the symbols page can really help you manage the chaos. I think that's a, that's a really big deal. So going back to uh, how all this stuff works and syncing and uh, symbols and all that, there is a feature similar to symbols that we've been using, we've all probably been taking advantage of for a while now, and that's shared styles. And that's uh, for a situation like, say for instance, this is a circle that is larger, and this is a circle that is smaller. Uh, a symbol wouldn't really work here because the symbol would make them all the same size. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they all share the same color. They sort of sh share pardon me, the same visual properties. So the idea is if I create a shared style, I can make sure that these all stay consistent. And I can do that over here on the sidebar. And I can say, um, let's just say colored buttons. We can even say colored round buttons since these ones are round. They're all different sizes, but uh, they could be circle, they could be oval, they don't even have to be round in order to share this style. And then I'll click in and I'll apply the same shared style to all of them. And what used to happen was you'd have an exception. You'd have a situation where they say, okay, this capture button here um, for the camera, can we make that a different color other than that pink color? And then you go in and you make your change and then all of a sudden everything changes. All the, all the items that share that style will change at the same time. 
And that can be really infuriating when you discover, say, four hours later into working on this, that you accidentally just changed every pink circle to red when you really only wanted to change this one because maybe you forgot that there was a shared style applied. So now, by default, when you make a change to an item that has a shared style on it, it is not going to update all of the other instances of that shared style. In fact, now we have a sync button, and when you click that sync button, it will do just what it did before. Uh, so it works much the way that uh, style overrides in other applications like Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign would work when you make a change to uh, shared style or uh, mostly paragraph and character styles have worked this way in the past in other applications. So now these work the way that we're familiar and you won't have that problem where you make a click and all of a sudden you have destroyed your entire document. It's usually not a problem if you catch it immediately, but if you're anything like me, you catch it a few hours later and undo is no longer an option. So this is a really big deal. Now there are a couple other little tiny things and uh, I said it would be my top three favorite features, but it's really going to be four because they've made some enhancements to the way artboards work uh, and it's very, very minor, but now you can ungroup an artboard before you would have to take all of the items off of the artboard and set them aside. Um, now you can just do the keyboard shortcut, for instance, Shift Command G to ungroup, and now that artboard is no longer an artboard. It's just the items are floating in space. Just the same way as if you ungroup items, instead of being in that group, they're sort of floating in whatever space they were in. So that's a, that's a cool little enhancement that they made. And another thing is, if I've got an artboard with content that runs on, let's say we're trying to show the developers here that we can fit a certain number of items uh, on this artboard. Um, as of right now, I've placed these outside of the artboard, and if I go to extend these which are inside of the artboard, they don't show up because they're inside that artboard and the artboard clips its contents. So if you want to extend an artboard to show all of what's inside of that artboard, uh, there is now an option if you select the artboard and you go over to the inspector, there's resize to fit. So if you click resize to fit, it's going to expand that. And now we've got that extra uh, space to work with. Uh, before you'd have to go and manually resize your artboard and now it's just one click. So just a little convenience feature. And as we make things bigger, we can go back and do that again and again and again. So it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish here. And if you've got these little outlying elements, like this little guy here was floating off of the artboard and we didn't know it was there, um, it will expand to reveal that. So you can make a mess if you set things aside outside of the bounds of the artboard and you're taking advantage of the fact that the artboard is clipping those, you can make a mess for yourself when you go to fit the content to the artboard. It can get it can get pretty messy. So that's the kind of thing you'd want to catch and delete. And you'll notice here it's not even allowing me to select it. So sometimes you can catch stuff like that by choosing resize to fit, and then we can select it and undo what we just did, and it remains selected when you hit undo, which is kind of strange, uh, but pretty cool, because now I can hit delete to get rid of it. So that's another uh, sort of pro tip. So you no longer have to worry about having things lie outside of the artboard that belong in the artboard if you're trying to show how the artboard continues on. Uh, you can keep everything in the artboard and then click one button and boom, it expands. So you don't have to make things too sloppy. And then the last little minor thing is when you've got items that are spaced unevenly. Let's say for instance I've got these, they're all spaced unevenly, and I go to select them and I choose to distribute the spacing vertically, which I can do up here. When I go to do that, if the math doesn't work out, meaning, let's say for instance, for those of you who like math, let's say we have a, a 10 pixel tall area, and we have three items that are each three pixels tall. That's a total of nine pixels, right? So if we try to distribute those evenly over 10 pixels, uh, it's not gonna work out. We either have to have the item in the middle on a half pixel, or we have to have a gap of, let's say, one pixel between the top two items and two pixels between the bottom two items. So that's what it's doing here. It's allowing us to say distribute unevenly, and a lot of people are misreading this as distribute evenly. It's distribute unevenly, which is the example where it has to put one pixel between the first two items and two pixels between the last two items in order to fill that 10 pixel space, or place on subpixels which could get a little weird if you're trying to be pixel perfect because these items are going to fall on half pixels and exporting uh, edges could be soft. They could become anti-alias. So that's something that you don't always want to do. 
So you can choose distribute unevenly if you want to get the math perfect. And then you can go through here and you can use option to measure. And that's a 44 pixel gap. That's a 45 pixel gap. So here we go. Here's the math breaking down. So if I want everything to be a 44 pixel gap, at least now I'm close enough that I can pixel nudge that. And I can take a look here. That's 45. I'll nudge that. And that's 46, so I'll nudge that up twice with the arrow keys. So now I've got it absolutely pixel perfect, and I don't have half pixels or anything weird going on. So that's uh, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, you're, you're now going to get the result that you expect instead of the computer deciding for you, uh, which is pretty awesome. So that's really it. Those are uh, those are the three to four major things that I see as, as a big improvement in Sketch here. And uh, I think the way symbols work and these overrides here are the biggest game changer. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully uh, there was some insight here into what doesn't meet the eye. Uh, hopefully I've shown you guys some stuff that's less obvious that'll save you some time. And if I did, please subscribe if you haven't already. I've got more cool stuff coming soon. And also I'll put a discount code in the description box below for my uh, Udemy course on Sketch if you want to learn Sketch 3 from A to Z. So enjoy guys.